Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Wadcast Podcast. I am your host, Eddie Ift. That's right. I'm Eddie Ift, and I am your host. Uh, not looking too good this morning. It's, it's, and when I say this morning, I'm recording this at like 2.25 in the morning. That's right. Because uh, that's what I do. I always make sure you have an episode every week. This week's episode is so damn good. Uh, because I just... I gel with this dude. I had my buddy, David Paradiso, the owner of Paradiso CrossFit, uh, multiple gym locations, been CrossFitting for multiple, multiple years. Uh, one of the best coaches I know, my coach, and um, just a great dude, a great uh, leader, a great uh, organizer of a community, a fun fucking guy, and uh, really knowledgeable about CrossFit and put together uh, look, I'm uh, maybe I'm biased, but I think one of the greatest CrossFit gyms in the history of CrossFit. So, uh, uh, yeah, so David's on this show this week. Each and every week, I bring you a new episode of the Wadcast podcast. It started out in CrossFit. Yes, it did. But I branched off and brought in a lot of health, fitness, uh, education, information. I always say I like to um, either entertain you or... Uh, inform you. Sometimes we just have a conversation and maybe it's like a hang for you every once in a while. So um, we've got some great guests coming up. We have the uh, old Armin Amirian, uh, a former host of the show, coming on to talk about the games and what's going on and all the big things in his life. Uh, we've got Eric Rosa, the uh, CEO of CrossFit, coming on. We have, uh, I've got some really cool stuff on the Patreon. On the Patreon, I give you the fifth episode. That's what you want to do. If you like me and you're not too into the CrossFit end of it, I'm doing some uh, other interviews. For example, uh, last week I interviewed Chris Cote, who is a ESPN, WSL, um, surfing, skating commentator, was former professional in those. Just a really good all-around guy. I also have... Uh, the uh, 16-year-old kid, well, he's 26 now, but he was the youngest kid to climb Mount Everest. I'm talking to him all the way from India. I met him at one of my shows when I was in India. Uh, he's coming on next week. Um, I, I just, I think the Patreon's a really cool way to, um, we like get, hooking you guys up and giving you a Myopux or a Leopard Claw, uh, which is our gift to you uh, if you win the drawing and you get yourself a, uh, you get yourself in the drawing. And you go, hey, uh, I get a Myopux or a Leopard Claw maybe? Yeah, there's a really good chance you're going to get one. Um, hopefully everybody has gotten there so far. Uh, but we uh, we here at uh, Wadcast are sponsored by Myopux and Leopard Claw. And a Myopux is an electronic muscle stimulator. I just gave one to a friend today who's got a torn rotator cuff. Told him he's got to get on that thing. And uh, he already told me he's already feeling better. He's been on it two days. So uh, it, it, it pulsates your muscles. It makes your muscles pump blood without damaging tissue. Um, and they're incredible. There's a whole bunch of them on the market. I tend to believe that Myopux is the best. It's the smallest. Um, really, really gets, gets the blood moving. And that's what the, it expedites the inflammatory process and what gets your blood moving gets the good blood coming in bad blood out into the uh into the lymphatic system the leopard claw is the coolest thing ever i wish i had one right here but it's a multi-tool device that you use to scrape you scrape adhesions out of your fascia google that and see why you should do it scraping adhesions out of your fascia anybody that works out hard should be able to do all this stuff and it's good for you but each and every week like i said we do four episodes if you give five dollars a month that's a dollar an episode you're going to get a fifth episode you're also going to get a chance to win a leopard claw and a uh together you win them both together uh leopard claw and a myopux and it's a value of about 450 dollars so uh, get on that as soon as you can. Um, like I said, we have a winner every single week. Our winner this week is, I just saw this. Here it is, Patrick Nilsson. Patrick, congratulations. You are the winner of a Maya Pucks and a Leopard Claw. Send us an email at wadcastpodcast at yahoo.com and Troy will take care of you. That's wadcastpodcast at yahoo.com. And uh, also, 
Um, if you have any questions, you can uh, get me at Instagram at, at Eddie. If you want to send me something you think is funny, I'll post it on our Facebook. You can message me on Facebook. Um, at Eddie Ift is the best place to find me, though. At Eddie Ift, E D D I E I F F T. You can also write to Wadcast Podcast at yahoo.com. But go to that Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Wadcast Podcast or Wadcast Podcast.com slash Patreon. Check them out. Take care of us. We'll take care of you. I uh, hope you enjoy the show enough. If you don't have money, I understand. Uh, go to Apple, iTunes, and just rate, review, and comment. Lately, I've been getting a little bit of some nasty ones. I'm not going to lie to you. They're usually really nice. And somebody said to me, why would you read them? Well, that's what we do here. I reward you for the good ones. And I tell you that I don't like you uh, for the bad ones. So um, let's read. I like to read the bad ones. I think that's more fun to read the bad ones. Um, The good ones, I love. I love them. I appreciate them. You're like, why don't you read the good ones? Uh, Because I don't know. No, you're like, well, why are you rewarding the people? Um, Okay. Here's one. Jacqueline Slaver is a star. She is. I agree. She was the nutritionist on the show. She's great. Somebody said, I'm a longtime listener. I love this one. Eddie and Jacqueline had a great rapport. And... uh, Jacqueline was so knowledgeable that Eddie actually let her just free flow and share all of her great knowledge without his need to interrupt. Yes, I did that a lot. And they said, love you, Eddie, but you know you have this problem. Yes, I do. I know. Um, And whoever wrote that, your name is can't think of a good name. That's a good one. I'll find you. No, I'm just kidding. Here's the here's the one they got mad. Talked smack about Gary V. It says talked smack about Gary V. Not smart. Um, I don't know if any of you know who Gary V is. He's a guy who's like really famous on the internet for I don't know what reason, but he uh, I didn't realize he's like the godfather of the internet, and I shouldn't talk smack on him because he's gonna come after me. But per T O L V, P R T Y O L V, told me I should not talk smack about him. It's not smart. Um, some other nice ones, very informative, great podcast. This is not only informative, but funny. I'm new to CrossFit and really enjoy learning about the sport, uh, through others experience and knowledge. Thank you. Atkins 902. Um, here's one monsterfully. Uh, this is a really good one. Next time I want to listen to white men lamenting about how scary it is for them out there now with cancel culture. I'll be sure, I'll be sure to tune in. I also love hearing about how Asian hate crimes aren't racially motivated from two white men. I'm so glad they cleared that up for, for my people on this stellar podcast about CrossFit. Stay in your lane, idiot. Thank you, monsterfully. I think he was referring to when we, uh, we are saying that the, uh, uh, do I think there's Asian hate crime? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's um, hate crime all the time from race to race. Um, I think people definitely go after and kill people and commit hate crimes on people of many different cultures. I don't think it's right at all. I think it's extremely wrong. The point we were trying to make was at that massage parlor that I don't believe that that was a hate crime. Possibly the guy is a mental illness, so... He's capable of anything, but we thought it was more of, he was, you know, a sexual addict and was trying to kill the thing that he felt addicted to. And it just so happened that the women that worked at that particular massage parlor were Asian. And, you know, it's just an opinion I have. You don't need to, like, go on iTunes and be like, hey, you fucking asshole, you, you, you white men. I love when people um, want to stop racism so they do it through racism um not always a great idea i think you don't you know like i always say you don't fight discrimination with discrimination you don't fight racism with racism there's probably a better way to address that so sorry monstrously this is why you don't write the mean ones you write the nice ones um I'll write read one other really nice one um 
Here's a nice one. Temple Man 51, the greatest podcast ever made. This podcast makes all other podcasts seem like amateurs. Eddie is a smart man, a handsome man, and a good man. Listening to this podcast will give you six-pack abs, and if you are a hobbit, listening to it will get you to the CrossFit Shire Games. The fittest of the fit podcast. Listen to it or you'll gain 50 pounds of fat and get diabetes. Do it. Hashtag listen to the intro. Hashtag still listening. Hashtag better off. Uh, uh, listen, I wrote that one all night and uh, I think it sounds good. Now, that sounds like I wrote that. That is Temple Man 51 and I thank you. Um, uh Oh, here's one. Here's a bad one. This is the last one I'm reading mediocre first 10 to 20 minutes is really random scattered thoughts dude loves to talk about himself a lot repeats himself a lot too would really like the show to be more focused on crossfit and comedy he can be a great host i just want to hear more about fitness rather than sexist comments if i wore these sunglasses i would get laid left and right kind of gross insensitive comments i'm sorry mizzou to chiefs um I think sometimes I ramble. Sometimes I say things like, if I wore these sunglasses, I would get laid left and right. I'm exaggerating. I'm married. We all know I'm not getting laid. Uh, the sunglasses aren't going to change that. I don't know if that's a sexist comment. I think a woman could say the same thing. Is it sexist then if a woman says it? People need to, um, before you cast your aspersions, you need to figure out really what you're talking about. Uh, I don't think that's sexist in the least bit. Uh, maybe it's gross. I don't think it's insensitive. Really? That's insensitive? Hmm. Oh, well. Please, now, after I read these, go and comment on Apple. iTunes. I love it. Um, I want to talk to you about a couple sponsors. Uh, where is it? Uh, Hunter's Academy of Strength. Uh, my programming that I'm using, I'm using the Murph programming because it's coming up. It's coming up. Um, Hunter McIntyre does my programming. I know I make fun of him, but the guy really knows his shit. Um, and that's why I use Hunter's Academy of Strength. Uh, if you want to use it, Hunter is giving a deal to all my listeners. You get 50% off your first month at HOA. I always have trouble saying H A O S training.com. That's Hunter's Academy of Strength training.com. He's got all different kinds of workouts for everyone out there. He's got training guides. He's got coaching. He's got an app. He's got, you just got to go to H O S training.com. During checkout, use the code WODCAST2021 and you're going to get 50% off your first month. All right. Every day, Hunter is going to give you new workouts depending on what you are doing if you're doing haos ocr if you're doing the pro which is more for crossfitters if you're doing the abc which is like simple like uh calisthenic type stuff and then there's one that is uh look good naked which is if you just want to look like me i mean i don't know chris hemsworth no you don't want to look like him he doesn't do leg day hunter's got a great plan the guy's an eight-time world champion eight times eight times he breaks world records he's a freak of nature and it's because he trains harder than anyone i know and trains smarter so if you want to train like hunter go to hunter's academy of strength and then thank me men women everyone great great programming uh like i said it's at haos training.com and use the code wadcast 2021 at checkout and uh, Hunter will take care of you 50% off your first month. It's only 20 bucks, I think, for for one training program. That's really cheap. So you're going to get it for 10 bucks. Okay? Try that out. Okay? Uh, let's see. Who else is our sponsors this week? Oh, I love them. I love them. I love them. Sell you core. Sell you core. Sell you core is the sponsor this week. Cause sell you core makes C for energy. And you can tell I've had some today. Um, I am powered by Carnosin, beta alanine, beta powder, and other key ingredients that support explosive energy, alertness, and performance. C4 Energy has got a lineup that's dominating the booming performance energy category across the country. 
They got 10 amazing flavors built on zero sugar, zero sodium, zero carbs, zero calories. C4 Energy offers a delicious way to awaken your super and conquer your goals. Awaken your super. Um, it's great. It's got energy you can feel. Naturally flavored. No artificial colors. It's not your average energy drink. They've packed it with clinically studied premium ingredients to support muscular endurance, hydration, physical performance for sugar-free energy. That you can feel. Okay? It's got caffeine in it, right? It's got uh, the 16-ounce has 200 milligrams. The 12-ounce has 150 milligrams. It's got a thing called carnosine beta-alanine. If you've heard about beta-alanine, you know what you're talking about. You know what you've heard. Matt Frazier uses beta alanine that he claims it gave him a third lung. He enjoys it. He thinks it's the best supplement you can take. Well, now you can take it with C4 energy. It's in there along with citrulline malate, beta power, beta, beta -nine, which is derived from beets and that helps your hydration. Um, it's great. And it's the only energy drinks that have been clinically studied to prove that there are performance benefits. They get a carbonated, non-carbonated version. You want to get 20% off, okay? 25, 20% off. Go to c4energy.com. That's the letter C, the number four, energy.com. Use the code WODCAST. That's the letter C, number four, energy.com. Use the code WODCAST. You're going to get 20% off. Don't settle for any energy drink. In fact, don't even settle for sugar, any sugar-free energy drink. The C4 lineup is the family that elevates your energy with clinically studied performance ingredients. Great flavors like cherry limeade, orange slice. Go now. 20% off. C4energy.com. Use the code WODCAST. All right. Now, we got to get to the show. This has been a big, big big intro and I love talking to David so I want you to hear I just want to mention I am going on tour I am booking dates left and right looks like the everything's coming back because all the club owners are calling me and I'm going to be at a town near you very very soon uh, this Saturday I'll be at the improv in Hollywood if you want to come see me I'm headlining the show on Saturday night uh, great 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 lineup a lot of my friends and uh, should be fun that's the improv. I think it's an eight o'clock show. Uh, but I'm booking my tour. My tour is, I think we're going to call it the not canceled yet tour. Could have a better name. If you got any ideas for my tour, give me a call um, or email. Drop me a line. Drop me a line. I am going to be, let's start naming some places. San Francisco, San Jose, uh, San Diego, uh, Michigan. I'll be in Grand Rapids and Ann Arbor. I will be in Reno, Nevada. I will be in Scottsdale, Arizona. I will be in uh, uh, not Tampa, Florida. I'm going to be in um, Naples, Florida. I'm going to be in Key West, Florida. I'm going to be in North Carolina, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm going to be in uh, how many other places? Jeez, so many, so many. Uh, British Columbia, Edmonton, Canada. Uh, so all these dates are going to be available very soon at edieft.com. I'm going to do when the, when the tour, when I announce the whole tour, I'm going to do a discounted ticket thing where you can get like on my special list and, uh, we will give you tickets as Wildcast listeners at a discount. So how about that? Um, but get your tickets, check out my Instagram, my new albums out called sweet home, Malabama. Hope all of you have watched it on YouTube or downloaded it on Spotify or Pandora. I've got a channel channel on Pandora. Please uh, download my channel or like click on it or whatever it is. So you subscribe, subscribe to my channel and uh, check out this show on YouTube because no one does. I don't know how we're doing on YouTube, but uh, please, you know, I know you're listening. Please watch. And uh, I think it's time to just get to the show. You guys ready? Let's do it. Um, hi, David Paradiso. How are you? I miss you. Hi, Eddie Ift. Um, uh, so you moved up to the woods near me, and uh, there was a fire. What? How long after you moved in? Two weeks. <laughs> Every single person before you move in are like, oh, the fire's up there. You're like, oh, I'll be fine. Two weeks later. Um, wait, that was very high. Uh uh, sorry to anyone that that just rang your ear out. Uh, what's, what's it like, uh, what's the saying for that? Like trial by fire or, um, 
out well, of the frying the pot into the fire. I don't know what the saying is. It it didn't. What I, I was what I've been telling everyone is the hilarity of that particular area hasn't seen a fire in fifty plus years, and I'm there for two weeks and get eva- I I was in I was in the only two areas that got mandatory evacuated. <laughs> well, when the last big one came through we were pretty sure we were going down. They evacuated us. And our little spot uh, up in the Santa Monica Mountains did not burn and has never burned. Yeah, pretty interesting. And they claim it's like a Chumash Indian burial ground. That's what everybody Ah. says. And they're like, uh, the Chumash, or the Chumash used to hang out there because it couldn't burn because we live in like a bowl, like a... The cold ocean air comes up over the mountain and then comes down into this little crater and uh, keeps it cool and moist, and we have all those oak trees. And oak yeah. trees are like fire repellent. Well, it hasn't burned. It's come up both ridges, like on both sides, but it just has never burned. But I was talking to the firemen, and they're like, when it does, it's going to burn like nothing's ever burned before. <laughs> they're like, there is so much growth there. You know, like yeah. it's it's good when it you know, I think we should do more controlled burns to, uh, well, well, for people listening to this, that don't know, like, uh, the fire that just happened in the Pacific Palisades, um, was set, set by an arsonist. Yeah. That was pretty crazy. It was a man-made fire. And so it happened outside of the, the normal fire season. So it ended up being kind of a controlled burn and everyone was like, kind of, you know, viewing it optimistically, like, well, that needed to be done. You know, 50 years of undergrowth that had to burn. Everyone's been like, you know, for the, the classic waiting for the big one moment. Well, the guy that's the arson that supposedly did it, allegedly did it, who they arrested and then had to let go, apparently, because they didn't have enough evidence. He covers himself in Foscheck, which is that chemical that the planes drop. Um, so he like runs around wearing that fire retardant and he makes these huge fire pits all over the place and he just lights shit on fire. I don't know if his goal (laughs) is to light the undergrowth and, uh, you know, make it a safer place or he just gets upset when they move him out of his homeless encampment. So he just tries to torch places, but it's him. They just can't do anything about it. Yeah. I heard they had him. I heard from a very good source that they had him and they let him out like the next day. Like they yeah. just, they couldn't hold him because a, a judge would dismiss it. And um, it, that's uh, many, I, I've heard that from multiple sources now. So I'm pretty sure that's true. And uh, people were posting online his picture and saying that there was a $30,000 reward to, to find him before they caught him. And uh, Bobby Williams, crazy Bobby that's on the show was like, get Hunter, let's go, let's go get him, let's go up into Topanga. Uh, and I'm like, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not hunting down a fugitive <laughs> for a $30,000 bounty. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, we'll get him. That's fun. Yeah, yeah. He's like, let's go get him. Uh, no, but I mean, it does tell, I mean, I hate to put this out there, but we were talking about it. We're like, if you're a terrorist and you wanted to really terrorize the United States in an easy way. It's like, it's so hard to get, get through airport security and this and that and everything. How hard is it to drive up the five or the one one and just, you know, just start throwing Molotov cocktails out the window and just right. go and see ya and then destroying California's economy. And I, I hate putting that out there cause I feel like the news, but it's something they should be prepared for. This is kind of proven, uh, that a terrorist can do some serious damage. Yeah, I mean, that was the same after 9-11 when they started listing every possible thing yeah. that a terrorist could do. To, like, I was like, you just gave them so many ideas where they're like, oh, genius. I love it. There was a movie, uh, Something Valor, and it was a movie about Navy SEALs, and mm-hmm. uh, it was made by the American military, and they used it as, they were like, this is the best recruiting tool we can do is we'll finance a film. The film will make money, so we'll make money on that. And then we will show like how badass we are and everybody will want to join. And I'm sitting there watching it going, you've just showed all of your equipment, all of your guns, all of your planes, all of your... (laughs) You just showed the enemy exactly what we have. 
I'm like, what are we doing? Like, what? Why is anything secretive? You know, every every secret we ever have in the United States gets out. <laughs> Just we're, we're like, hey, c- come get us. Well, I mean, and that's that's one of my. Just bring this back to CrossFit. I always just say it's like, you know, it seems funny to have, uh, you know, secret team meetings, right? Like every, every, all my plans are going to get out, you know? So it's like, be, <laughs> be uh, transparent about it, you know, and just see if you can catch up kind of thing. What you are you, that? what are you doing in the gym at eight o'clock at night? Is this when you work out or are you coaching? No, my, one of my primary jobs is I, I still meet every new member that's never done CrossFit. Oh, awesome. That's a, that's a really good thing to do. Yeah, um, wow. That's, well, and you, I basically keep my schedule open, you know, most days like 7am to, to 8pm and people can book. And then that, that kind of dictates my schedule a little bit. And, um, and that allows me to kind of bounce around, see both gyms, different hours, uh, and meet all the new people. Are you still the owner of three gyms? No, just two. Which one did you get rid of? Kawhi. Oh, you did? How come? We all already were planning on it. Um, you know, we didn't we didn't buy the Kawhi. So we bought Kawhi CrossFit in November, about three years ago, something like that. And we didn't buy it to make money. It was like a lifestyle thing. Like we wanted to have like a cool outlet um, for our staff, our members, ourselves, right? From LA, go out to Kauai, you know, maybe have retreats out there, something like that. And, and they needed a new owner. Uh, it was a good deal. And so we, you know, the idea was trying to create this um, kind of annex outlet and, and support the Kauai CrossFit community. Mm-hmm. But they, at the end of the day with, you know, two little kids and, and the gyms yeah. here going through turmoil, like we were, because we were in debt here and this is where all the money was made. Uh, we just needed to have our energy and physically be here. So we were always like absentee, landlords over there you know right just right like, right and it was draining our energy and and there was a and it, it worked out really well that one of the original a guy that's coached there on and off for, for seven years uh just retired from the military and wanted to run the gym and we you know basically made a deal the pandemic hit and it was just like perfect timing to transition because you know Kauai locked down his borders and they they were they were basically good to go like so they were operating normally and we, there was no way we were going to make it out there. Right, uh, right, right, right. They, they yeah. were they were making you quarantine to get in there, and, uh, and so we're still friends with them, and, and right. still you know we want to go back. You know we have a community there. We just don't own it. So yeah. Um, well, people don't understand too when you when you took that on. I was like, wow, you're you're biting off a lot right now because of that. There's just such cultural differences between America and Hawaii, and yeah. and people like you go over there. Yeah, I'm sure you get it, but like most people don't realize they're like, Hawaii, vacation, blah, blah, blah. But they don't realize, uh, you know, th- th- there's a weird thing about doing business over there and being a Howley. I mean, I've I've done shows over there and it it has been impressed upon me on how much I need to employ Hawaiians as my openers. Yeah, yeah. And uh you know, there's just this like, and taking care of like locals, you know, like there are guys just walking into the show, just not paying. And I'm like, wait, you just let people in for free. And they're like, uh, some people, you know, and I'm like, oh, oh, I get it. You know, like, so I, I imagine it was, it was a bit of a st- struggle in that way to, 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 to do it. Well, hundred percent. You know, I mean, they, uh, I'll say this. If, if uh, you remember this, I lived in the Virgin Islands for a few years. Mm-hmm. So when I got out there, they, you know, they were a bit apprehensive, you know, guy coming from the mainland. Uh, and they were like, you know, I, I'm a laid back guy, you know, and I, I did my best to be respectful of the fact that they were an existing community. I didn't say like, we're going to do it my way. And the yeah. parodies of CrossFit, I didn't change the name to parodies of CrossFit. I kept the name um, and, you know, worked all the classes hung out every day and and they saw that i worked hard and fixed the facility up and a lot of them were like curious i was like well i I, i've lived on an island before Mm -hmm. you know where i was the minority Mm -hmm. as well and they again they were they respected that a lot oh that's cool Uh, but 
you know, it, it's still, it, here's one thing that I tell people about island culture that unless you live there might miss, even if you go on vacation, uh, take the Hawaiian islands. People think, oh, it's Hawaii, right? Oh, go to the Hawaiian islands. Every island has its own unique culture. Mm-hmm. It's not just, oh, they're all the Hawaiian islands. People think, oh, they're all the same. Maybe they look different, but the people are all the same and it's not true. Yeah. You know, when you look at, and this is what defines Kauai, if you know this, you know, uh, King Kamehameha. Yeah. He conquered all the island. He united the islands as like the first chieftain to do so, but he never 100% conquered Kauai. Oh, I didn't know that. Right. And so that's one of their, that's their legacy is that they were, they were not able to be conquered completely. And that kind of transferred over to tourism. Right. They didn't allow tourism to conquer their island either. And so they're very proud. You know, it's very much locals only kind of island as ve- very different. If you go to Maui or Oahu, there's a much deeper integration. Uh, it, is is Kauai the one in the surf world that you're not supposed to post pictures of surfing? Uh, possibly. It's not as public of a surf culture there for sure. I, I I think I, I think it, I think it's quiet. I know one of the islands they get really mad if you if you post photos. Like you're just yeah, that's a know. that's a no no. I mean, people don't like that in general anywhere. Um, you know, you you bring out a camera to surf spot and people are like, "What are you doing, dude?" Like an iPhone. If you're like a professional photographer, it's one thing, but you bring out your iPhone and you're going to text all your buddies and be like, "Hey, waves are good. Come down here." People want to kill you, and. Um, but I've heard Kauai, I think it's like an unwritten rule. You don't post any pictures of spots or anyone surfing there, anything, because they just don't. I mean, now that you say it, it's like I, I don't remember seeing any pictures of people surfing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I'm sure you know Hoffy from. Yeah, I'm, I, I think I'm having him on next week. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, I've seen some. He posts, you know, he's born and raised there, but he he posts photos every now and then of like, you know, epic surf, and I'm just like, where is that? Yeah, <laughs> I hate when friends do that to me all the time. They'll show, post a picture, and then you're like, where is that? And they're like, I'm not telling you. And I'm like, oh god, uh, you know, if I, if it's a friend, I always say, here's where I am. You know, this is you can go there. Yeah, it's not going to be the same when you get there. <laughs> It'll right. be completely right. different by the time you get there. Uh, I had heard I was just in Maui, and I had heard a friend of mine from here, a neighbor of mine is a developer over in Maui and he was telling me sort of the King Kamehameha story of when he conquered Maui, he pretty much destroyed it, like destroyed everyone there. And Maui is run a movie about him, by the way, I, I should actually watch that cause I find Hawaii so interesting. Um, but so I could be completely wrong about this, you know, cause I'm not a great listener. Everyone knows. Um, but he said, that uh, so Maui's kind of run by the Japanese and the Filipinos, I think, um, because all of the Hawaiians that lived there were were kind of wiped out by King Kamehameha. And hmm. going back to like thinking when I was in Maui, I'm like, yeah, I didn't see a lot of of islanders like I did in Honolulu. Um so I, I don't know if that's true. I'd love to I'd love to see more of the history of Hawaii. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure uh, the, the Rock is going to be King Kamehameha in a movie soon. <laughs> well, there are so many funny stories about him. I think King Kamehameha was he the one somebody gifted him deer or something. And there's like islands. I think it's like the Big Island and another. Island. They're like overrun by Axis deer that yeah. aren't indigenous to the island and the same could go for for uh Boer. I'm not sure. Uh but they just like overrun the place yeah. and uh the one thing they don't have is snakes. I think that's so cool. No snakes cuz you're in like such j- creepy like jungles, but you don't have to worry about it. Anything. Basically nothing was on the islands. Everything was brought there. Yeah. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. Well, every, that's why they just that's why they eat poi. Was it um was it tough running a gym there? I, I would see, you know, it, it seems like locals don't have a lot of money. And uh, yeah, there was there was a lot of that, you know, like you're making 50 percent of revenue yeah. from locals and then 50 percent from people traveling. And were they demanding the same thing that everyone does now? All rogue equipment that's like uh, costs you 
an arm and a leg and no, that's where you know that's what we when you buy the buy a gym it's like that's you know often like what you're paying for is the used equipment so particularly out in Kauai, it's like you know you don't want to ship equipment out there it's expensive um but it was funny we redu- we actually reduced the rates on the request of the members again this is the, the idea is like i was listening to what they had to say i reduced the rate i think i gosh if this is, this might be i think we reduced the rate to 80 bucks a month wow Wow. Uh, and then it was funny. We'd have these like postcards, like 80 bucks a month. And then people were dropping in from out of town, paying $25 a day <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's there for the mainland. You know, let me ask you this. You know, you've been running a CrossFit gym. What is it? Like 12 years now? Yep. 12, 12 years, years uh, in many different locations, many different uh, lo- uh, you not just locations, but different gyms. I've always had this theory that rogue is the one that not, not rogue, but the CrossFit games is what made CrossFit harder to be profitable because of the amount of different equipment like that you had to buy. Like the overhead just got super expensive. Am I wrong? Yeah, I I wouldn't say the amount of equipment or any of that. I think the, the fr- I actually remember it was uh, Lauren Glassman, maybe even in your interview with her, uh, she was talking about the games caused the first uh, non-organic growth in CrossFit. Mm-hmm. So it changed the dynamic substantially, and that that created multiple kind of groups of people of what they wanted to get out of CrossFit. So in the earliest days, it was very grassroots, very, you know, people just learning together, kind of, you know, garage, gym, online community, doing something crazy and weird and exciting. And then the games came in and it was still crazy, weird and exciting. But then it it's as it dovetailed, it just the, the sport was not for most people, obviously. But the people that were into the sport were the most hardcore about CrossFit in your gym. Mm-hmm. So the needs of, of those two groups, balancing them became the hardest part of, of being a gym owner for a lot of gyms, I should say. Yeah. You know, I would say the games caused a big period of time. And I think it's, it's actually winding down now as the sport has become more and more uh, serious and professional, you know, for lack of a better word, you know, it's a, a, a full-time sport. People aren't pursuing it anymore. They're, they're like, there's no scenario. They're going to go to the games. So there's less people that are that are pursuing it. And, and I, I'd say as well, I think one of the biggest changes that's happening is all the original people that did CrossFit that are still doing CrossFit 10 years later are now moving into their 40s. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're just they're, they're looking at CrossFit now more as long term versus wanting to PR all the time, wanting to compete in every single class of the day. Everyone's kind of maturing a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You know? it translates to the bigger community picture. Uh, and managing that stuff, but yeah, yeah we all, games- we always thought that would happen though. There'd be an evolution of it. I just the point I was trying to make is, you know, I have a little home gym here, and I buy dumbbells, and right. I'm just amazed at the cost of a dumbbell. Yeah, and I think about the fact that you know Castro will make an announcement saying it's going to be, uh, you know, uh, this week it's going to be dumbbells, you know shoulders overhead or you know ground overhead uh women it's going to be 35 pounds men it's going to be 55 pounds so as a gym owner and you're doing the open and you're going to have eight classes a day with 30 people coming in and there's everyone's got to have those dumb you're like oh my god i've got to have 15 sets of of 55s i've got a 15 sets of 35s so and then the next week it's 45s and 25s and you're like oh my god i have to buy every single dumbbell and have enough for the whole class then i've got to have enough plates for everyone then i the, the bars now the rogue bars they they range anywhere from 255 dollars to 600 dollars for a bar and you've yeah. got to, you've got to have a bar for every person in the room and yeah. it, it used to be that the whole idea of CrossFit was that you had great coaching. I used to talk about how I'd say if you could go to like you're a boxer and you could go to a really good facility or a shitty facility and a good coach, 
like a really good facility, shitty coach, or really shitty facility, great coach, which one would you rather go to? And I'm like, I'd much rather go to that great coach, shitty facility, because I know he's going to be able to do it no matter what the equipment is. And I feel like that's what CrossFit was in its infancy. Then as it developed into the games, not that it became shitty coaches, but it became all about the facility, which made it like a globo gym, which was like, we want to have the best this, and we want to have the best that, and 16 GHD machines, and 27 rowers, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I'm just looking at you guys as owners trying to make a living and be profitable, and I'm going, oh, this is just crushing you. Like, Well, there's no doubt about it that the the... Dy- the changing dynamics of CrossFit, the way that it's continually evolving, is the challenge for an owner, right? And you're absolutely right that, you know, I, t- I tell people this all the time. Back in the day, every single thing we were doing was new and unique and no one had done it before. We were just doing strength training. We would talk, we would spend, you know, we did main site, right? So the whole, the whole day would be five by five back squat, right? And we'd spend the first part of class talking about why you should squat. And why you should do strength training and how you brace your midline and draw pictures on the whiteboard, right? And people would just eat it up like, holy shit, this is amazing. Oh, wow, I'm, I'm squatting, yeah. right? 12 years later, everyone squats in every program across the country. CrossFit changed the dynamic sure. of fitness, period, right? So now you have athletes that are 10-year CrossFit veterans, they don't need to know how to squat. What they need is a, is good program, good support. You know, they they do need coaching still, but it's in a different capacity. Mm-hmm. But next to them in the same class, there is someone that's going through that same experience that they went through a decade ago. So it's a brand new person in class with someone that's been doing CrossFit for a decade. So it's a very like those changing dynamics are that is the challenge of a CrossFit owner. There are people that hang on desperately in my opinion, to the old model. They keep trying to sell coaching, but that's not wrong. It just really minimizes the market. So if, if someone's been, you know, I talked to a, a, someone that was selling their gym. They asked if I wanted to buy it. And he was kind of talking his opinion about all this stuff. And like, we take a big part of our culture is the allowance of open gym. Mm-hmm. Right. We allow any athlete to use the gym on their own outside of class, as long as you're respectful of space. Um, and we don't make them pass a test. Right. To do that, we just say some days you're sore. Some days you want to come in. Some days you want to stay after class. Some days you want to make up a workout. Uh, there's flexibility for people. And and a, and a coach was uh, this other owner was telling me, you know, we don't allow open gym because what we're selling is coaching. Mm. And it minimizes what we're selling. And I just can't imagine looking, just imagine this scenario. And, and then he went on to tell me how he has the great, this great new 22 year old kid that's a coach. So just imagine this, Eddie, you've been doing CrossFit for a decade and you're like, Hey, I'm dropping in from out of town or I just moved to the area. You know, I just, you know, you're looking at this, 3,000 square foot facility. There's five people in class. Hey, can I squat over there? Oh, I'm sorry. We don't allow that. Yeah, but there's a lot of room right over there. I just want to squat. I'm sorry. You, you're here for the coaching. You mean the 22-year-old kid over there that's been doing CrossFit for three years? I just want to squat. And it just, in my mind, it, it treats the client, a CrossFit athlete, like a child. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, know what? I- you know, it's funny. You saying this, it goes back to in the very beginning of this podcast, I said that was eventually going to happen. I said, CrossFit has, is giving everybody the template. They're, they're, they're educating everybody that at a certain point, it's going to be like, when I first started lifting weights, you know, 20, 30 years ago, whatever people were like, you're going to do three sets of 10, you know, and then you can do five, four, three, two, one, you can do this and you're going to do back and buys one. And you kind of learn and everybody, and that was kind of like the way to do it. And you learn, and then you don't need a trainer. Once you do it for like a certain period of time, you've got it. And then you start helping the next guy that comes in. I said, eventually, everyone's going to know CrossFit. Right. So that is going to minimize the coaching. So I'm, I'm glad to see that you've figured that out. And I think that other coaches or other gym owners that don't see that are insane. 
because well, again, it's not wrong, you know, it, it's, it, but it's, it's marginalizing the experienced CrossFitters to say that. You but, know, it's but like not just the experienced CrossFitters. People used to not know what I mean. I hadn't seen a rope since like gym class in like third grade or a, a medicine ball. Everybody knows these things. Everybody knows plyo boxes now. Everybody, all the stuff yeah. CrossFit brought back into the vernacular, into the space everybody's familiar with them and everybody has a general idea of how you do it, what you do it. Even the beginners come in and they're like, yeah, he's got, I've been watching this on TV or I've watched a whole bunch of videos of this, you know, yeah. you don't really have to search the internet. It's getting thrown in your face constantly and on Instagram. So it's the education is uh, we're like inundated with it. So it's gotta be a challenge for you guys to like how, so what are you selling a facility? <laughs> Well, to come back to it, it has to be both. I'm selling my, I have the best facility and the best coaches and the best community and the best value and the most flexibility, right? And and the only way that I can make that work, again, I, I always say like my my specialty is running a CrossFit gym in a metropolitan urban area, right? Like I, I say like it, every CrossFit gym is different. My mom living in Appleton, Wisconsin, her CrossFit gym is very different than Dairyland Cro Dairy CrossFit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, th that running a gym in Vegas, you know, that yeah. there are business considerations to be taken. It's not just the, the here's how best to coach CrossFit. There are business considerations to be made. I see people that because they have a small facility, they limit their members to when they can attend class. Oh, you're, you're signing up. You have to pick the hour that you attend mm -hmm. class. You're a 9 a.m. athlete. Mm -hmm. They have to do that to maximize. They can't have people showing up whenever because mm -hmm. they can't risk 15 people showing up into a room that only holds eight. Mm -hmm. So they, they, there's all these business decisions. Imagine running a gym in Vegas. How many drop-ins you get every single weekend? You're going to have to make accommodations based on business needs as well as uh, how to best get people fit. Yeah. You know? And so I've made a series of decisions that move me in this direction. That's, that's why I've prioritized having bigger facilities because I want to allow more, I want to allow more open gym. And to get back to the original point of the equipment, I want to have some of that specialty stuff because I want to attract more high end athletes who like to work out on their own, but I don't need enough for an entire class for that stuff. Right, right, right. right? So my whole <laughs> idea is have some of that specialty stuff, allow for open gym, which you don't necessarily program in a group class, but it's there for the higher level athletes uh, or games level athletes. And having those athletes in the gym does create a certain vibe environment that's motivational and inspirational to a lot of members. Yeah, sure. Sure. That the idea is like, I want to, but I don't want, I don't want that games athlete environment to negatively impact the group class. I want to have enough space that they can both work. And that's the way that I, so it's like the skiers, right? You know, that I, as what, as I know that's what you're referring to, right? In the back in the day, the only cardio machine you needed was a rower. Now it's a rower and it's a salt bike and it's the concept two erg and it's the ski erg and a woodway and a bike and the assault air runner, yeah. right? There's no scenario. So now what's happened, the natural progression is that when we do a workout that includes rowing for calories, it's take your pick. We've got assault bikes over here ski we don't have enough for everyone to be on the same thing but the culture is that it's okay to interchange yeah yeah it doesn't really matter if right, you're doing right. the calories on a rower yeah you know i remember when i bought when i bought my assault bike i uh i just went online and i did this whole evaluation of what's better for my money a c2 or an assault bike and it was basically it said you're do the you're getting the same function out of both of them. Right. So um, it doesn't really matter. So it's like whatever you get a better deal on, buy that one. And right. uh, cause like what you're looking to get, I always joke that James Newberry, I would train at his gym for a month every year. And uh, I go, I'll tell you the secret to being a CrossFit games athlete. I go do Olympic lifting 
and get on the assault bike all day long <laughs> constantly because that's all I see him do. He's on the right. assault bike constantly. I'm like, you want to increase your engine? Just get on there and just go, 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 go. I go, that's all he does. And he's, and he's like superhuman. Um, I go, and then you got to get strong by doing Olympic lifts. But, um, you know, I, I think you've figured it out because to me, that's what, like, there is a point as me as a CrossFit, like guy that was never competitive or had the capability to be competitive, um, would look around the room at the diehards that, thought they were going to be games athletes that had no chance that were intimidating that were like devoting their life to this yet had no chance, but look down on me. I see it in surfing. You know, there's the guys that wait at the surf spot all day long and they're just constantly there and they think, and it's like, guys, you're, you're average, you know, like you're on the whole scheme of things and you're, you're, you're intimidating everyone who just wants to get in shape when at the end of the day, we're all doing the same shit now, but I still love to see some guy, you know, deadlift 600 pounds, or I love to see someone just smoke some, you know, do a two minute Fran or something. And that was, like you said, that was inspiring. So when you see that stuff, it's great. But when it's a whole gym of that, it's not great. It's, uh, because unless it's like someone like Matt Frazier's coming in to work out for the day and you're like, holy yeah. shit, or yeah. someone from your gym that has the potential of going to regionals and then to, to the games, or even if you have a team, you know, that's good. But I, I, it was intimidating. Now, uh, now it's time to talk about eat the 80, eat the 80. Uh, that's eat the 80, which is, um, uh, you know what? I should actually talk to our guest about Eat the 80 because um, you've tried Eat the 80, have you not, David Paradiso? I have. Delicious. Is it not? <laughs> yeah. And it's the most simple ingredients in the world. Like, first time I ate it, I'm like, this is too good to be true. Uh, and then I looked at the ingredients. It's like salt, pepper, olive oil. And I'm like, I use salt, pepper, and olive oil, but my food never tastes like this. Yeah. No, I mean, having, having a pre-made meal is obviously very nice and something that's simple like you would cook you know i'm just like a meat and vegetables kind of guy you know? yeah yeah it's got everything you need it's got all the macros it's got the meat the, the the if you're doing a starch you can basically create what you want to because they've got like 30 different uh 30 different uh i think every month there are 30 different uh, uh meals on the on the uh on the menu and they interchange or they they take them out and put new ones in but they've got a lot of the favorites all the time i'm a big ch chicken and dumpling guy and the dumplings are gluten-free for some reason uh i i mean we know why but i don't understand what gluten is and never really will but i know i shouldn't eat it uh but i eat the, the breakfast scramble all the time i i order so many of them and i'm using them like what would you try what were some of the meals you did the uh, one of the chicken is like chicken and yeah, they got a lot of good chickens and potatoes and so good uh, a turkey burger. Well, one of the cool things they've done for guys like you is you guys can as coaches and trainers, you they have a program where if your members eat it and use your promo code, you get free meals. So oh, nice. if you go to info at eat the 80.com info at eat the 80.com and just say, Hey, I want to be affiliate. Uh, let's start working together. They'll send you business cards. You can hand them to your clients and you get, I don't know what it is. If like so many people sign up, you get like boxes of meals sent to you. It's just such a good deal. And it's a good way to monitor your clients. So you're like, yeah. you, I remember you always telling me you'd have like a client going, I can't lose weight. And you'd be like, what'd you eat today? And they'd be like, I ate well. And you're like, really? Send me a picture of everything you ate today. And they're like, uh, uh, and you're like, yeah, Doritos, not good. <laughs> so with eat the 80, you get them all, you're like, Hey, just eat three of these. You'll be fine. You, it's giving you all your macros and everything you need and, you know, good proteins, good fats and, uh, and good carbs. So, uh, so try them out. If you just want to order it, go to eat the 80.com. Or if you want to get to be part of the affiliate program, go to info at send them an email at info at eat the 80.com. And, uh, thank you guys for all the great food you're sending us. Now that I work out at home, 
I miss the environment. I miss going in and competing. Like as much as I, I didn't like competition because I was like, this will get me hurt. You know, like I'll try too right. hard and I'll get hurt and I'll do things I shouldn't do. Um, I do miss that like three, two, one, go. Like there's no procrastinating and I miss people forcing me to warm up. I don't warm yeah. up. I don't right. fucking, I take my Theragun out and I'm like, what muscle am I working? <laughs> but I know like when I'm surfing, I'm like, shit, I, sh- I, sh- I should warm up more. <laughs> I should cool down. And the gym forces me to do that. And that's, I mean, there is, uh, there is Wait, just, you know, I don't know how much I've told you, like my, my big long-term vision of it all, but one thing that happened with the pandemic. So I, I'm, one of my classic lines I tell people these days is I have a, I have a mental illness. I don't know if you know, it's called optimism. <laughs> uh, just like the whole pandemic. I think this is going to be net positive. Yeah, I do too. I do right? too. I look at when I look at this, I'm like, I think people are going to come out of this. I like saying like, man, we need to get fit for the sake of national, you know, national pride and national. It, it like, you know, it makes the, our whole country work better if we're all fitter. Um, that, People will start to understand fitness for the sake of health, right? How those things are connected. Um, but one of the things that I've, I've believed would happen for, for a long time is that home gyms would become more common. As more people understood how to work out, it's how CrossFit started. Mm-hmm. An online community. I started in my fucking kitchen. Yeah. Right? I had a couple basic pieces of equipment, and I got incredibly fit working out on my own with a couple basic pieces of equipment, looking at workouts online for free. Right. Um, and there was an online community and then obviously CrossFit gym started opening and offering something more that competitive nature, the camaraderie, the socialization, the coaching on the more advanced things, things you couldn't do at home, dropping weights, climbing ropes, swinging on rings. So the way I've always viewed it, and and so take that as one thing and that the pandemic streamlined them, right? Home gyms now are, you know, a thing. Awesome. I think it's awesome. Um, I've always, when I started CrossFit, I said that literally the day I saw Mark Twight training the actors for the movie 300, right? I called my roommate in the room and I said, they should have gyms like this. <laughs> this is what PE class should be. Yeah. And I still believe that if you, in, in a single generation, if you get PE class, to be what CrossFit is starting with exactly what you do in CrossFit kids all the way through high school. And you create a population that knows generally how to work out. They would go to our gyms, not for the coaching. They already know everything. Yeah. They go for the socialization, for the facility, for the camaraderie to do things they can't do at home. I view it a lot. Like, you know, I tell people I went to university of Illinois and there was this, um, training area we had a population student body of like forty thousand people and throughout the campus there are these these big fitness areas there was one that was a big dome called the armory with an indoor track right where people are just showing up inside the track there were spots that getting rented out where people are doing like capoeira and and shit and on the outside of the track there were free weights and gymnastic elements and it was just a big community center yeah you know, I said, that's what I foresee in the future. Have you ever, it, have you ever been to Chelsea Piers in New York? No. Chelsea Piers is like that. It's a, uh, you, uh, I think you join Chelsea Piers like a, like a, like a health club and it's got aerobics. It, it's like a globo gym to the max. It's got a track. It's got a rock climbing wall. It's got pools. It's got, uh, ice skating. It's got, um, volleyball basketball weights just sitting in random places a boxing ring in a oh, random great. place hurdles that you can just set up and start running uh you know m- massive free weight areas and and uh t- and spinning rooms and and it's just like you join and it's just like you go and you can exercise all the time and do all this shit and it's wonderful it's great um and I, the point is that still like right now the truth is like every single day I meet someone new to CrossFit where the most fundamental aspects of fitness and movement are mind blowing to them. They know most of our adult population 
know literally nothing <laughs> about, about movement, fitness, or nutrition. Or it, or if they know something, they're they're confused. They're not sure. You know, um, and so there's just a, this huge divide between like that vision, right, where people would know how to take advantage of that, and and that's that's where I was talking about the fitness industry as a bit as a money making machine doesn't want an educated populace. They don't want people fit. They want people unfit, scared of fitness, right? I there's people in the CrossFit community, like a lot of consultants that will basically push personal training as the way that basically you should be finding clients that care enough about themselves to invest in themselves and pay you top dollar to coach them and basically you're the professional and they need you our my my idea is very different is to empower the individual to empower people to not need someone to feel comfortable to train on their own right when it moves into higher level stuff or very individualized stuff or pro movement problems that you have you hire a coach for specific needs yeah but not day-to-day -day training no i mean that's where i would be right now i you know i follow uh for a long time now i've been doing hunters uh hunters academy of strength programming uh mm -hmm. just good friends with hunter and i like a lot of the stuff he does and for a while i did his his like hardcore shit and i was like hunter i can't do this all i've got to right. scale the shit out of this like i've i, I can do you know this I, i'd be in the gym an hour and a half i need to cut all of this stuff down and he's like okay so take off one one exercise out of this one one of this one one of this one and then he he created a couple other you know like he's got his look good naked he's got his abc he's got and he's got three different four different programs and it's just not that i don't know what i'm doing because i've been doing it long it's that sometimes i just don't want to think about it 100%. I, ju I just want to look and go that's what i have to do today and, right. um, and I know Hunter knows what he's doing. You know, he's, yeah. he's, he's done it. You know, he's, he's, he's achieved something. And he also, what I like about Hunter is that one day you'll see him running in the mountains. The next day you'll see him doing something completely different. It's always completely different. And it's not this like, you know, by I, far, by far, again, I, I meet all the new to cross with people. I put them through a little workout, you know, blow their minds. I, I love, I get, <laughs> there's a group of people like over the pandemic, like where their gym was like, they go to gold, mm -hmm. you know, and then they're like, fuck it. I'll go to CrossFit because you guys are open and gold is closed. And then I'll give them literally a 10 minute workout and they'll just go, what the fuck have I been doing at the gym for the for two hours? <laughs> right? But, uh, but, um, oh, where was I going with that? Oh, the, the, the programming, when, when people start, number one question, or one of the number one questions I get is they do the workout, and I'm like, what questions do you have? And they go, how many days a week do people do this? <laughs> right? Or how often should I come in? You know? And, and I tell people, the truth is, if you come in and do what we do, if you come to cro CrossFit group class two to three days a week consistently for months on end, and you live a generally active lifestyle, you'll get really fit. Yeah. It's the truth. It's, it, you, you eat decently well. You sleep decently well. Like, again, your basic lifestyle is active and not sedentary. You do two to three days a week of CrossFit consistently. You will get fit. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I drank the Kool-Aid like everyone else. And I remember when it was like six days a week. And I couldn't even believe I had to take a day off. And I'd be like, blah, blah, blah. And all I did was hurt myself and I just couldn't understand because I wasn't as good as anybody. You know, all these other guys were so much better than me. And I'm like, am I not working hard? Blah, 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 blah. What's wrong with me? And it just, I had to just come to terms with the fact that like I didn't have the genetics or I didn't have the age or I didn't have whatever it was that those guys could do. I couldn't do. And then I just realized, oh, maybe if I only do this like three days a week and then go for runs and mountain bikes and surfs and all this stuff. The next thing I knew, I was happier, and I was hurt less. I had less injury, and I was and still, I still would go in and do CrossFit and feel really good when I would do it. I'm like, I'm still not as good as I was, but I'm, I'm good at this. Like, yeah, and, and again, so I, I, one of the things I tell a lot of people is the life cycle of a CrossFitter. 
I, the majority, the majority, not everyone, the majority of people that sign up at our gym are former high school athletes. Yeah. I would think right? that's, yeah, I would think that's even true. like me. I was not even a starter on my varsity soccer team. Right. But I played soccer for 18 years of my life. Uh, and I love fucking around, jumping over things, climbing things. I just view myself as an athlete. Mm-hmm. Right? People that view themselves as an athlete, they come in the gym. They are like, holy fuck, I miss this type of environment. Right. And we treat them like an athlete. We give them space to learn and grow. Uh, we guide them. And what happens is most people walk in the gym initially and go, I just want to look good naked. <laughs> right? It's very aesthetic based. I want to lose fat. I feel and look like shit. Very quickly, it transitions because of the athlete mindset to, I want to be able to do something. Fuck, I want to get better at that workout. Man, I want to do what that guy can do over there. And they get fitter. And this little bug gets implanted, like, fuck. They start doing things they never believed they could do, right? And then it goes, I wonder how fit I can get. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's the thing, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Is I wonder how fucking fit I can get. And you just keep, like, you because you keep getting fitter, and then you run into your limitations, mm-hmm. right? You're like, fuck, you know, I went too hard. I didn't recover. Because when you get to that level, it's not just the workouts. All of a sudden now, if you want to come in five, six days a week, you got to be eating properly. You got to be doing soft tissue work. You have to be sleeping. You have to move really well. And and so then it becomes an even. It's not even just five six days a week. It becomes the the Two workout, days. the warm up, <laughs> the recovery. The food, and it's like a full time fucking job. Yeah. Right. And most people don't want to do that. Yeah. You know. And that's where. And then it eventually evolves into what happened to you. Right. Yeah. It's like yeah. okay, I'm gonna back. Like, what am I fucking doing with myself? Yeah. Right. I'm. I don't need. I'm already really fit. And then you just back off the volume a little bit. And then it becomes more about sustainability. Yeah. Like I love going to the gym. I love, I love this shit. I just, I know I'm fit and it becomes more about that continual aspect, but that takes athletes time to work through that process. Yeah. You, hard for them to walk in the door and be like, Oh, trust me. You don't need that much. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That moment in the evolution of it where you, uh, you feel indestructible is hilarious. Because yeah. I remember going through it where it's like, <laughs> so fit right away, right? you know, you're just out somewhere and somebody's like picking something up to put it in the back of their car. And you're like, I got it. You know, like I'm, you don't know what I'm made of now. Right. And, and you start to believe you're invincible and you start thinking like, I can go run that race. I can do that. I remember one day. How old were you when you started CrossFit? I think I was about 38. No. Yeah. How old are you? I'm almost 50. Fuck, man. I didn't realize you're so old. Um, I, you I remember one time just being shit-faced in Vegas and uh, shit-faced and getting in an argument with some guy because he was telling me I was drunk, blah, blah, blah. I asked him where he was going. He was going to run a marathon. And uh, I was like, what? He's like, the rock and roll marathon starting in like an hour. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. What are you going to run it in? And he's like, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, that's slow. You know, and I'm just giving him shit. And he's like, yeah, have another drink, buddy. And I was like, yeah, I will. And then I'll fucking beat your ass. You know, and I'm just talking shit to the guy. And he's like, all right, yeah, we'll see. You. Okay, drunky. And he just keep. and I'm like, all right. And I've run a marathon before. And I was like, where are you going to start? Like what, what, uh, what, you know, cause they have the pace times, what pace time are you going to be at? He's like, Oh, I'm at the, the, the 10 30. I'm like 10 30. You're running 10 30 miles. That's so slow. And he's like, yeah, whatever, man. I'm like, I'll meet you there. And I just felt so indestructible and I hadn't trained for a marathon at all. And I went down there drunk and ran the rock and roll marathon in Las Vegas. Shit faced just shit face. And I finished it and I did okay. And, but it was the, but it probably, I talked to a doctor friend of mine, a cardiologist. He's like, you're an idiot. He's like, you're an idiot. You really could have dehydrated yourself and really like had a heart attack. And I said, Oh, I drank a ton of Gatorade before I went. And I, I stopped at all the aid stations. And he's like, don't do anything that dumb again. But I remember just feeling like I do CrossFit. I can run a marathon. I can do a marathon drunk. I can. And a lot of that is, you know, just your mind over matter 
Because I yeah. probably should not have done that. Like physically was not. Uh, and I remember I had to sit on the stool that I had a show that night in Las Vegas. And I had to sit on the stool because I couldn't stand up. I was yeah. so sore. And, uh, and I just remember like, maybe that was unhealthy, like to do, <laughs> but there was that invincible, you know, I can do anything. I'm, and it was fun. I wish I, I wish I could have that attitude all the time, but it probably got me into danger. Well, again, it's, see, I, I'm not going to say, you know, to do that, mm. but one of my, again, other many lines I repeat all the time is listening to the cues of your body is one of the hardest parts about being an athlete. Right. Mm. And again, you were drunk, but just say running a marathon with no training, just take the drunk part out. Like I'm going to fuck it. I'm going to go do this. And you're, and you're running it and you're halfway in and you get this pain in your knee and you're running like, fuck. If I keep running, is that going to be permanent damage? Mm -hmm. Should I push through this pain mm -hmm. or should I stop? Right. And that happens to people in the gym, right? If, if anyone, you should see it's hilarious. Because someone in the gym goes like this, they're like, ah, they like touch their shoulder and do like a little, like, oh, I'll, I'll just like, what, what is that? Like, what are you doing? Is your shoulder okay? And like, fucking 100 pull ups today in the workout. Yeah. You know? And, and they're like, oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> like, is it fine? Like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. Right. But it's hard to n understand what to do in those moments until you fuck up. Yeah. Like, like our athletes, like in the earliest days, this is one of the, I'd say an evolution that I've had of might be controversial. I don't know to say out loud. Um, like when, like basically if you live your life as an athlete, you get hurt more often. So you learn yeah. not to get hurt in the earliest days. I was so terrified of people getting hurt in CrossFit. And then, you know, a lot of people at the, at the gym get hurt outside the gym. You know, they go skiing, snowboarding, play basketball, whatever. And they show up at the gym like, oh, I'm fucked up from some shit. But, and then we help them modify their workouts. But people do get hurt in the gym. That's the truth. Sure. People right? get hurt doing they, everything. They miss, they, they miss a clean. They hurt their wrist. They, they, you know, do, you know, too many pull-ups and their shoulders, you know, are, are strained. And I, you see, you know, fuck, you know, I, I feel guilty. And, and like, I wonder how I could have prevented that. And time and time again, the athletes would work through the rehab and they would come back and keep training. They never held it against me. Mm -hmm. And it was almost like, ah, I fucking knew it. Right. Like I fucking knew I shouldn't have done those pull-ups. Yeah. I was feeling something. And, and at the end of the day, they, they work, they accept that responsibility as part of their lifestyle. Yeah. But I, also, I, and I also think what you're saying is true. Cause I, I, I knew, I've been there, yeah, but I also, too. but I also think in injuring yourself, like people used to make fun of me, Kenny and Armin and everybody used to make fun of how injured I was all the time. And well, I, do, I don't get injured anymore. And it's not cause I, I, I've kind of learned my body, but I also, if I do get injured, I know how to fix things now. I know how to like, like treat my body. And I know yes. as soon as something starts to happen, I get out my myopux. I get out my leopard claw. I get out my Theragun. I start using voodoo floss. I've, I've learned yeah. so much of like self rehab that, and I can help so many other friends that I'm just like, yeah. Oh dude, you need this and do this and take some curcumin. It's and like, don't, you know, someone just recently was like, Oh, I know, I know so many people that got hurt doing CrossFit and they were like a guy tore his peck off doing a bench press in CrossFit. And I was yeah. like, well, is, is it bench? Should we not do bench press? <laughs> yeah. I said, my buddy's, my buddy's dad tore his quad off, off his knee, oh. walked upstairs Yeah. Oh. because he didn't do fitness. Yeah. True. Right. And so it's, it's, it, it's very challenging to say, but the idea is, you know, and I say this all the time about fitness professionals, they, want to say like this is perfectly safe but there is no such thing no no and i it's funny i was i was talking to friends today we were joking about shark my buddy was saying don't go surfing because they there was that la times article about the sharks around how, how many are actually out there? yeah and i've always i've always known they're out there 
Like yeah, I, I know saying, that, and that's that's. I was the, standing up for you today, and I was like, "Oh, this is great white territory." I, I had a guy today. I was surfing at I won't say where, but a guy yelled shark. Oh, a guy really? yelled shark today, and uh, it was a it was a pot of dolphins, and it's like, right. but still, it's like I started to paddle in, and I and I had seen the dolphins, and somebody was like, "There's dolphins," but it was in my head from that article. Oh, but, it's the worst. Yeah. But but anyway, and but I know they're there. Um. And my friend was like, I've been warning you about this. And I, I'm like, you play golf all the time. Look how many people get struck by lightning playing golf. And he's like, people get struck by lightning surfing too. And I'm like, yeah, people get hurt. And then I looked up all the statistics of people being injured. And it's like, I think it's basketball is the number one sport of people get injured the most. It's like not yeah. even football. It's basketball. And then it's football. And then it's like soccer after that. There are, but, but the bottom line is. You show me a group of CrossFitters and you show me a group of non-exercising people, we know which one's healthier. Well, and, and I said as well, you know, again, this like kind of post-pandemic view of health and fitness. And, and I believe that the message of CrossFit's dangerous and bad for you is going to start wearing thin because when people look around at their friends, the, their friends now have been doing CrossFit for 10 years are the fittest people that they know. And sure, they've had some shit every now and then, but they're the fittest people they know, and they've been doing it for 10 years. Yeah, They're not, like, in a fucking wheelchair. They're fitter. They've dealt with shit, and, and other people often have still have issues, too. This is, this is why I have Eric Rosa coming on the show in a couple weeks. Oh, and nice. one of my things that I have, uh, that I kind of rant about in CrossFit is that we need to give more spotlight to the masters athletes yeah the masters athletes are the real success story of crossfit not the kid that's 22 years old that can do unbelievable shit that any great athlete can do at 22 years old but the guy that's 65 that's doing muscle ups and running a 10k in 20 some minutes and or i mean uh, 5k in 20 some minutes and he's doing you know deadlifting 475 pounds that's the guy the dave hippen steel i i always mention him like what the fuck is that guy doing because because ah. he's done he's done it for years and he's lived it's like in stand-up comedy uh jay, jay leno used to say it's not a sprint it's a marathon there's a lot of guys that i've seen get so much bigger than me and they explode and they become this big famous comic and then five years later, they're asking me for spots to open for me. And I'm just like, all along, I've just headlined everywhere around the world, just constantly, and just maintained this. And and I hope to do it till I die. I hope when I'm 90 years old, I'm still going out and doing stand-up, just as I hope I'm exercising. So I think our success stories in stand-up need to be those guys that are still like in the masters that are... Oh, well crushing it the way, I, the way i phrase it is again not, it's not even about crossfit was in theory a data driven you know methodology and the thing that i've said what what will be most interesting is to see crossfitters you know me when i'm 70 80 years old yeah you know like those people not, that's that have been doing it throughout their lifetime what is happening to those athletes like, that's going to be the most powerful stuff is, is the average person, not even the competitive masters, but mm -hmm. just average people that have been doing CrossFit as they age, what happens? What are what is that group? And it's because it's going to be a big group of people, you know, that intellectually will like they're into fitness, active lifestyles. This is what they're going to do and how they're going to work out basically forever, you know? Yeah. And it'll be interesting to see what happens. Like, uh, what, what's your one biggest like concern with doing CrossFit style training, like as you age, you have anything? There's a couple things I've cut out. I, I don't do handstand pushups. That would be the one. That's the one I'm like, the one area I'm curious again on long-term impact is, I mean, no pun intended is, is handstand pushups on the neck. I I'm mean, just I'm not one, I'm not one to tell Castro, uh, how to program, but I just think, you can achieve everything with an overhead press that you can achieve with a handstand push up. that it's just not net. And I know they're like, Oh, everything's dangerous. And I'm like, not as dangerous. Like, I feel like that is the most dangerous, uh, 
and maybe not just uh, like acutely, but like chronically. Like I think, I think there were times that I was doing it, that I was pushing so hard and I was coming down harder than I should have, especially kipping that I'm like, am I compressing discs right now? Like, is this, it's Again, just not a good I, movement. I the answer because, you know, you, you take the example of like third world countries holding shit on top of their head every fucking day. Maybe it's making our neck stronger. Good point. You know, good, I don't know. Good point. Uh, I, I don't, I literally don't get a lot of injuries from that. Yeah. Like the gym, it, do, it doesn't happen. Uh, there, like, were, there were days I walked away from it yeah. that I felt I, like. That's no, no, not okay. good. But like a lot, like other parts of your body, you know, like it's weak, low back or shoulder. Yeah. Um, but that's one area I'm interested in the long term. That um, and, and um, a couple athletes that are like, you know, specifically they had an injury that prevents them, you know, but that's pretty standard for a lot of them. You know, I have people that can't snap no matter what. It'll yeah. never happen, you know, based on the shoulder injury they've had previously and whatnot. But yeah, that's the one, again, for me, area that I'm, I'm most interested in. Um, and then it'll be interesting to see stuff like do CrossFitters have a higher rate of hip replacement? You know, I, yeah. Interesting. I mean, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? So yeah. I, I think that's interesting. And, and all those things ideally will continue to uh, adapt. And cause that was, um, that was, it's funny you say that that was the big argument about MMA in the beginning. They were like, MMA is safer than boxing, even though they're bare fisted, basically, you know, like they wear the smaller yeah. gloves. But there, there's way less hits to the head. They're like in a in a fight, you know, compared to a boxing match, they're getting hit so. And now it's like now that Rapping there's years, yeah. now that there's years of of it's evolved, they're like, oh my god, these guys all have CTE and they're all, you know, they've gotten hit so many times in the head and blah blah blah, and it's so dangerous. And it's like, well, yeah, you didn't, you didn't like really, you thought that argument was gonna hold up that like. When they're getting their head smashed against the ground, uh, you don't think that's dangerous. So, look, every single sport out there is dangerous, and it's like, how are you going to survive it? I mean, I I've got a, my father in law, who's the you know him. You've you've coached him. Uh, football, is it football that did it, or is it his genetics, or is it you know? Because you look at like he played football, you know, high school, college. And pros, so that's like an maybe a fifteen year period of his life. We know people that CrossFit longer than that, you know, like, um, or is it the weightlifting he's done? But he's had bat, he's had two hip replacements, knee surgeries, ankle surgeries, elbow surgeries, wrist surgery, you know, like shoulder surgeries, like everything has gotten fixed on this guy, and it's like, is it football or because I know some football players. Not that much, you know, like I think everybody's kind of different and it'll, it'll be hard to say with CrossFit. Um, I think all your joints take a toll. Um, my elbows are my thing. Like my shoulders are great. I started using crossover symmetry and mm -hmm. I swear it was like the greatest thing for my shoulders ever. And yeah. anytime somebody tells me they think they have a torn rotator, I'm like, get crossover symmetry right now and get to work. Um, yeah. that, that saved me. I mean, I used to be in constant pain and now I'm just like, Holy, how does how, they're amazing. They never hurt anymore. And it's just, I do like, you know, 15 minutes a day, every like couple days a week. Uh, but you know, elbows, mine's the elbows. Yeah. And, and it's, I've had one break. And just t tendonitis like crazy. And I think I had this argument Maybe. with Maybe fault. Pat Barber and I argued this. I told him that I think CrossFit has way too much flexor work and not enough extensor. He's like, you're crazy. What are pushups? What are this? What are that? What are da, da, da. And he's just like, you're wrong. And, and kind of to his defense, he was kind of right. But I'm obviously not doing enough extensor work. It's your baby carrying, Eddie. It's just holding babies <laughs> for fucking five years in a static position. Ugh. I'm telling you. Brutal. I went to Zion with my kids, and I had to carry them through the narrows, you know, just, uh, for hours. And then the next day, another hike. And then one of them just wouldn't walk, you know. And, and you, it's just and you, and you carrying put it them at night. You won't sleep. And then you're carrying. I, I'm telling you. 
And you put them on your shoulders, and that only lasts for a little bit before their thighs, their hamstrings start hurting, and they want down. And then, yeah, they're the worst. Kids, kids are the best worst thing in the world. Um, I use the uh, Izzy rode well in the in the backpack. Uh huh. Cruz just wants out. He's like, screw yeah. this. I want out. Um, you've got two girls. You're the luckiest man. Oh, fuck it. I'm a crossfitter. I'm not using no backpack. Oh, you're crazy. You're, you're crazy. Um, you are also lucky that you have two girls. I, my girl is amazing. My boy is the devil. Today, <laughs> today I'm sitting on the couch checking like an email and I hear this noise and I turn around and he has pulled the hose into the house. And I just look at him like, what are you doing? And I had bought a new gun for the top of the hose that has a jet that is so strong. Mm-hmm. And I just look at him like, what are you doing? And all of a sudden he just starts spraying down the whole house <laughs> and then shoots me. <laughs> I come running at him and he just laughs and shoots me in the face with it. (laughs) And I'm just like, what? How, how do you, how did you, you're two years old and you just, you just wasted our (laughs) living room. And Lauren was out of town or not out of town. She was like out. I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to explain this. Copying a TikTok prank that he saw. (sighs) But he's two years old. He's doing this at two. I'm dead. I'm yeah. dead. I've got like basically like 16 to 18 more years of him ruining my life. And, uh, and I've just like, there were points today where I was just like, what am I going to, I gave him a, he asked for water. I gave him a cup of water and he took a sip and then just threw the cup like full of water. And I'd be like, I, ah, you know, cause like, I come from, I'm in the new school of like, oh, we talk about this and we do this and blah, 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 where my dad's from my, you know, I'll t- call my dad. I'm like, what do I do? And he's like, you swat him, right. <laughs> you teach him a lesson. He'll never do it again. I'm like, I, I don't know. I think that kind of creates aggression. He's like, no, it doesn't. I'm like, dad, I got in about 200 fights in my life. <laughs> you, you whacked me around and I took it out on other people. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know how to stop this kid. My one friend's like, he's going to keep walking all over you. <laughs> he hosed it's, me down. It's an impossible scenario. <laughs> My daughter would never have done that. Well, their boys and girls are different, obviously. Oh. But I, I don't know. Yeah. This gender neutrality shit, whoever wants to argue that with me, come to my house for one day. Spend a day with my boy and my girl, and you will never say that there's gender neutrality like no, i mean uh, men and women are biologically different you know i always i always just use the example of how women's brains the two hemispheres have significantly higher percentage of connective tissue which means that their brains physically i mean they're physically different mm-hmm. you know men's two hemispheres are separated um i mean that's that's just one example <laughs> you know yeah there's um, also a thing in men called testosterone <laughs> You know, like this whole argument, the me too thing, when it was going on, I was like, uh, do you, do you know about hormones? Do you understand them at all? Like when women are like, I can't believe men do this and men do that. And men, and I'm like, yeah. do you, do you, do you know what hormones are? Have you ever seen what happens with dogs when you fix them, when you neuter and spay dogs, like how it changes the dog? Do right. you, should we just. Do you want to do that? Because I feel like that's kind of what society wants to do. They want to neuter. like, And look, everybody knows sexual assault and sexual harassment. It's not right. I'm not arguing for that. But they are just got to a point where, you know, you're not even allowed to tell a woman she looks pretty or this or that. You know, like, there's so many degrees of it that it's like, all right, let's just let's just cast right. Everybody, let's just line up and just cut everybody's balls off because I don't think you know what it's like. I look back at like how when you go through puberty as a male, <laughs> like what you start thinking and what you start trying to do and the dumb shit you'll do because of it. I'm like watching my two year old now. I'm like, what's he going to do when he's 13? 
Like, what's this kid? What's that? Yeah. The dumb shit he's going to do. So you're lucky. You just have to deal with the emotional problems. Yeah. Yeah. Some people say that's worse, but I don't know. There's not, no one wins. So are you still are you still doing the comedy show at Paradiso? Yeah. Every Saturday night. Yeah. I, he- I heard you. A, a bunch, a Hunter, Hunter and a bunch of people went la- last week. Yeah. For Jim's show. Yeah. And uh, my old buddy, Jim. Uh, yeah. He said he remembered us. So I was like, I don't know. Yeah, he he was there that one night. The menu, the the the, the slap, the the unhooking of the bra, all that stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah, you were there that night. Um, that was the beginning of the end. Uh, how long do you think you'll be able to do that? I mean, it's like a lot of things. We're just feeling it out. You know, it's who who knows when indoor comedy shows will be a thing again. You know. Yeah, I mean, I I'm not touring till. <laughs> It's beneficial for everyone, for the comedians, for right. our community. It's awesome. I loved yeah. it. It was so much fun. Um, yeah. And it's, it used to be in comedy, the last thing you wanted to do was an outdoor show. Like it was the last thing. Like when somebody goes, it's an outdoor, and you'd be like, oh, yeah, no way. And now it's like, it's all I want to do. People are like, hey, you want to do my show? I'm like, is it, where is it? And they're like, oh, it's in this bar. And I'm like, eh. Outdoor show, yeah, love it. Do it whenever. Um, and there's For everyone really- listening. We we've been hosting comedy shows in our parking lot of our Venice gym every Saturday night. You know, we get like a hundred people or so show up. And but beyond awesome. beyond COVID, what I want to say is like you have a community, and your community probably those people had rarely ever gone and seen stand up comedy, and so. You like we have a world, we have a product to sell. We bring it to your community, and your community loves it. And I've yeah. said all along, I was like, I should do stand up at CrossFits. Like, it's just what a good time for like to get your CrossFit gym together and do a fun event. And I know you open it up to the public too, but you know, if it's a one off, you get your whole gym, and that's enough for an audience. You yeah. know, come out on a Friday night or a Saturday night. And I was supposed to do one one time in Wisconsin where I invited all these CrossFit gyms. And on the way there, my flight in Chicago, got I got stuck in Chicago and couldn't make it. I got canceled, like my flight. And so I had all these people coming. I had to give them their money back and everything. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I've said I'll do them anywhere. If any CrossFits out there want to have me, I'll come do a show for you and you know, split the money with you. You make some money, I make some money, and we have a fun night. It's a, it was, a, uh, where'd you end up getting like a microphone and a, uh, a speaker and it, with, that I mean, wasn't, the, the guys hit me up asking if we'd be willing to help them out. And I said, sure. You know, That's outside a, of our normal class times, why not? You know, we're, we're blessed with, with a parking lot in, yeah. in West Side of LA. So yeah, you're, you're one of the few yeah. ones, Exactly. but, um, no, but for these people out in the sticks somewhere, yeah. Do it because um, most states, the comedy clubs still are not open yep. or they're at like 25% capacity, which yeah, is weird. not fun. And there's no yeah. way for us to make money. So, um, well now you're in the neighborhood, you know, you can, you can hike on over. You just come up the, uh, the backbone trail. You're only right. a few miles away. Um, are you liking it up there? Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it- Checked off a lot of boxes for, again, raising a family, you know, living on Abbott Kinney for nine years. Yeah. yeah. The kid can run around outside. Fucking, there's a blue bus that runs down Abbott Kinney now, you know? So it's just a busy street. Yeah. And we wanted the kids to, I mean, have more <coughs> access to outdoors. So it's, it's great. We got good landlords and we didn't buy a house, you know, we're right. just renting. And, uh, that's yeah, great. I don't mind the drive at all. It's like, Half the drive is down a windy canyon road that's very engaging, like a fucking EA sports game. Yeah. And the other half is driving down PCH. Yeah. You know? so, the PCH. It doesn't bother me at all. The PCH drive is unbelievable. I always, when my wife would complain when she would be driving the uh, Izzy to school and back in Santa Monica, she'd be like, oh my God, I'm stuck in traffic. It's terrible. And I would always go, look to your left. Right. And she's exactly. like, what? I'm like, look. And she's like, what? I'm looking at the ocean. What? And I'm like, yeah, you're looking at the ocean. I go, people save money their whole lives to go to vacation. Where exactly. you're looking. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, and, and it's just like the, how some people's perspectives can be different. I'm like, don't ever complain. 
you are but it's pretty it's pretty cool that it's you know it feels close to our gym you know it's 30 30 minute drive actually to either gym because one i'm more on highways and one you know, going through venice but um yeah you know i got a, got my first commute well that's awesome um i'm very proud of you everything you've done you've made you pretty much do you think it's pretty much over right you're you're out of the uh well for all we know yeah. but but the the shit's june over 15. june 15 is the big day yeah now that things are supposed to be you know all all the all the restrictions are supposed to come down i think on june 15th the mask mandate and everything and hopefully um you know rosa was talking about the uh the, the funding coming in for gyms and that'd be nice yeah. to to take care of uh, especially gyms gyms should have been yeah. given money i mean ridiculous what we spend money on and um but let's hope that happens um thanks for doing the show uh anything you want to plug uh no i mean <laughs> come check out the gym if you're in the area yeah. i mean nothing, nothing crazy we got two great gyms um a lot of space well your gym your gym is famous like all over the country every time i say they're like what gym do you go to i'm like well i don't really but my gym is paradiso crossfit that's where i like yeah. came up and um and i always say uh you know, check out your videos whenever, like my nephew always go, how do I do this? And I'm like, I find one of your videos and send it to him. Cause you have a whole catalog of stuff on YouTube. Yeah, I, I can plug that. One of the things we started, um, probably, I don't know, eight weeks ago, we now post, uh, our workout with a little video discussing what to do for every workout of the day. So every week we post seven new videos with the workout description. And I talk about how to do it it's geared towards people newer to the gym. So if you go to our YouTube channel, you can, there's a workout you can go through for weeks and pick something out that you can do and have a little bit of coaching for me. All right. There. And let me know, we're going to do a night hike one of these nights and go up the backbone, uh, yeah, at night. It's, it's pretty creepy and fun. Uh, yeah. so let me know if you want to go. Um, thanks for doing the show. Tell Martina I said hi and, uh, congratulations. Good luck on everything. I will. Thanks. Man. All right. See you.